Hey guys, I'm Yari and welcome to my channel, Manicure and Murder Convos. Today we will chat about serial killer Bell Gunners. So grab your manicure kit and paint your nails with me, or grab a snack, or grab both as we pass no judgments here and let's jump right into it. Today, the only advice I have to you related to manicures is if you feel lazy and don't care to do a manicure, then just put a clear coat of polish and carry on until you are well and ready. So anyway, Bell Gunners. Her name initially was Brent Hill Paul's Data Source Set. And later on, she went on, she went on to be known by her name, Bell Gunnis. Anyway, she was speculated to have been born on November 11, 1859, in Norway. Um, it was also stated somewhere that at 14 years old, she worked on farms and then one time she was pregnant somebody assaulted her and she miscarried and that's all i have on that well anyway bell continued working and when she finally saved up enough money she made the decision to move to chicago and that move happened in 1881 which is also the same time that she changed her name to bell once bell arrived to chicago she started living with her sister and her husband and then she got a job as a domestic servant and also in a butcher shop then in 1884, Bell meets this man named Matt Sorensen, and they decide to, one, they get married, and then they decide to open up a candy store. The candy store doesn't do well, and for some unknown, unknown reason, that candy store goes up in flames, and they collect business insurance on it. So after this fire, Mads and Bell start having children, and they buy life insurance for these children and not long after obtaining life insurance for the for the four children that they have two of the children become ill and after becoming ill they die um and after the autopsy a medical examiner stated that the children had inflamed large intestines which is indicative that they had ingested some type of poison. However, nothing will come of that, and Mads and Bell will collect the life insurance for the two children. Then, on July 30th, 1890, Mads, Bell's husband, falls ill and he dies from brain hemorrhage. Oddly enough, July 30th, 1890, is the precise date that Mads' two life insurance are active at the exact same time, meaning that both life insurances will have to pay out if no criminality is suspected. So, Bell was interrogated or interviewed, and she's asked, hey, what happened? She states that Mads got home, stated he had a headache, she then gave him medication for that headache. He went to take a nap. When she went to check up on him, he was dead. There was nothing to discredit her story. Therefore, she was paid out both life insurances. Then after, Bell decides that it's time to say goodbye to Chicago and she moves to LaPorte, Indiana, and that is in 1901. About a year will pass before she will finally meet a man named Peter Gunness, who is a widower. He's also a butcher, a hog farmer, and has two daughters, one being an infant, and they will go on to marry on April 1st, 1902, and that is how Bell obtained her full historical and unforgettable name, Bell Gunness. The new family a week later, after getting married, experienced death as Bell is watching over her the infant stepdaughter, and she, for no good reason, dies. Then, nine months later, Peter, who is a skilled hog farmer, and so he makes he decides that he's gonna get some slippers, and he doesn't realize that this heavy sausage grinder is over his head, and this grinder that never moves all of a sudden moves right on top of his head and kills him instantly. As you can guess, he has a life insurance. But it is determined that his death was an accident and Bell was paid his life insurance of about for like $4,000. So anyway, not long after that, Peter has a brother who lives in Wisconsin and no, he visits from Indiana and he basically tells Bell, listen, I'm taking my niece with me and I'm becoming her caretaker. But Bell fails to mention that she is pregnant by his deceased brother, and that is that. So sometime after that, Bell adopts a young lady named Jenny 
Olsen, and not long after, she gives birth to a baby boy that she names Philip. Then in 1905, Belle starts placing marriage ads in newspaper, as she starts getting people who respond to her, and one of the people is a, is a farm guy named Henry Gerher. Um, Henry arrives on her farm and stops all communication with his family, which is really odd because he wouldn't do that. The family reaches out to Belle and she basically tells him he did come here. However, he's decided to go to Chicago to trade horses and he left, you know, whatever. So point is that what people find odd is that he left his truck there and an overcoat. Well, following Henry's rush goodbye in 1906, another man named Joe Mo answers Belle's marriage at um, promising to give her financial support. And neighbors take notice that not only is a new man in the house around Belle's children, but also that the young Jenny Olsen is no longer around the neighborhood. And they ask Belle about her, whereabout, her whereabouts, and Belle assures him that Jenny is off in college. Immediately following these concerns, people also take notice that as fast as Joe Moore arrived, he departed, but also left his truck behind on Belle's property. So now she's just accumulating trucks. Then another man comes around named George Anderson, and Belle cries to him that she needs money, so on and so forth. And he says, listen, I'm going to help you out. But one night while he's sleeping, he realizes like that bell standing over him, holding an object over his head. He gets scared. He gets dressed. He leaves the house. And basically he makes it back to his hometown of Missouri. And he is the only suitor that bell had that is recorded to have left and survived going to her, to her land. So anyway, there comes to, there even came a point when bell has started ordering heavy, heavy trunks. However, the person who would deliver the trunks to her stated that he was never able to help her bring them into the house and she always kept her shutters, her shutters closed and that she would basically, like I said, carry the trunks herself into the house. Anyway, on April 6, 1907, an elderly widower um, named All, he befriends Belle and doesn't tell his family that he befriends her, but then he basically is seen at Laporte Savings Bank where he mortgages his land, he signs over a D, he obtains a few thousand dollars in cash, and basically then his sons notice like, you know, where's dad? And they learn that he's hanging out with Belle. But when they go to ask Belle, hey, where's our dad? All Belle insists that she's never seen him. While the year 1907 was still active, Belle makes a decision that a helping hand will not hurt, and she employs this farmer named Ray Lanford. Ray works on the farm, and he notices men come and go, and one day during the month of January, January of 1908, a man named Andrew Helgenen shows up to the farm after he exchanges a few letters with Belle, declaring their love for each other, and Belle tells him, hey, can you make your move permanently here? And he says, okay, he shows up with a check of $2,500 from his savings. Um, Bell convinces him like, Hey, put this in my bank account. He agrees, but then he goes missing after that. And days later, Bell is recorded to have deposited over a thousand dollars. Though Ray had not worked too long on Bell's farm. Um, they were not seeing eye to eye and it's speculated that the animosity between Bell and Ray stemmed from Bay Ray being in love with Bell and allowing his jealousy of seeing other men coming and going from her home to interfere with his assigned duties and that causes Bell to fire Ray sometime during February 1908. Immediately after firing Ray, Bell hires a man named Joe Maxson as the new help. On March 1908, Bell was expecting another gentleman to show up to her house, but whatever reason, this guy never shows up and he explains that basically things happen and he can't go. Um, then she, at the same time, she had been corresponding with another guy, but he didn't have money to support her, so she didn't allow him to come over to her land so those are two men who survived because they didn't show up then during this time things continue to escalate with ray to make matters worse the brother of andrew Helligan that i mentioned before is desperate to find his brother and this causes Belle a lot of stress because she knows that there can be consequences then after firing bell um she thinks things will simmer down because she fired Ray. However, she is wrong because Ray then starts harassing her. She files reports that he's mentally unstable. Point is that her allegations are taken seriously enough that he is put in a mental institute for a quick moment, but he's found of sound mind and he is released. Ray then continues to make threats to her and Belle decides nobody's going to do anything about it. So I am not going to report him anymore. So Belle, I mean, Ray continues to harass 
Now, what she does do is she goes to her lawyer and lets him know this is all going on. I'm afraid of Ray. I need to get all my ducks in a row, so on and so forth. And that's that because she obviously fears for her life and the life of her children. So anyway, um, she does ask her lawyer to draft her will during this time because she's afraid. So she also went to the bank and paid off her mortgage. And then with that, on the early morning of April 28, 1908, Joe, the new, the new help, wakes up to smell smoke and he calls out to burn the children, but there is no response and the fire takes over the house. Um, once the fire is put out and all that remains and that the remains were ruined the three children were found dead in the beds and a female body was found without a head and the head was never recovered and point is they believe that this body belongs this female body belongs to Belle. obviously with all the excitement of the death of Belle and her children her lawyer shares with the authorities that Belle had told him about ray and all his threats ray is questioned by the authorities when he finally touches base with them he goes on to ask did widow gunness and the kids get out all right when asked about how he knew about the fire he basically said it's town rumors um like anyone else you know he's being now ray is being accused he's a suspect but he says listen i didn't do anything but a guy stated that he saw ray leaving the property after the fire happened so that is that also numerous friends have seen the body the headless body and claimed that that body did not belong to bell the body was examined and it's determined that the headless body had belonged to a female that was about 5 5 and weighed 150 pounds but was known to be 5 8 and weigh a, around 180 to 200 pounds however many exam led everyone to believe that the female body was not bell and months later it was disclosed that the female body organs contain a large amount of poison Anyway, so how was it finally ruled that the headless body was in fact a belt? A dentist came forward and said, if you get me teeth, I'll be able to compare and contrast it to dental work that Bell had before, and we can prove if it's her or not. Lord and behold, nine, May 19, 1908, while the location was being searched, once again, a piece of bridge work was found consisting of two human teeth, and the roots were attached porcelain teeth and ground crown you know had it had work done in between point is the teeth were examined and supposedly they belonged to Bell, and that is how against all other odds the body was labeled to be that of Bell. none of the new news deterred andrew's brother from meeting up with authorities to share that up that his brother was missing and point is they started doing an investigation on the house even though they believed bell was dead they go onto her property and they start seeing that there's holes that have been repacked. Joe, the new help, says, yes, Belle had me repack those holes. She said that there was garbage in them. So point is, now the story goes from bad to worse. A couple of men are brought in onto the land on May 3rd, 1908 to dig up these holes. And sure enough, they start finding body after body after body. Some were able to be identified, some were not. They believe that the total amount of bodies that were found were about 12 of them. However, many did remain unidentified. There was about, I'll say, six people that were identified when exams were done, but many couldn't be identified. So then anyway, after the bodies were found, many people came forward saying that they believed that their family members and friends were missing because they went to visit Bell. But like I said, they haven't been able to identify many of the bodies. Um, also on May 19, 1908, remains of seven other victims were found buried next to two coffins in unmarked graves in the same section that this but the body of Andrew and Jenny were found. Oh, I forgot to mention one of the bodies that were found and identified was that of the adopted daughter of Belle, which her name was Jenny. So they found her, but then next to her, they found many other bodies. So anyway, with that, with that, no other, um, with no other suspect, you know, they go back to Ray and they believe that Ray, um is the person who kills bell and kills her children in the fire and he they charge him with murder and arson however his legal team 
disputes like hey that body that they found is not that of bells so point is that they do charge him with the arson so on and so forth but they do not find him guilty of killing bell and the reason for that is because when they did a reconstruction of the scene it turns out that the teeth wouldn't have been able to survive that fire so like i said regardless of the evidence ray was found guilty only of arson but acquitted of the murder of bell and on november 26 1908 when he was sentenced to 20 years in prison he ends up getting sick with tuberculosis and he then ends up admit on uh, admitting on his dying bed that he had helped bell kill people i'm um, not kill people but to hide the bodies of the people that she had killed basically he said that bell used to poison these men and people that would come over once she got what she wanted from them and she then decided that she was going to fake her own death he also stated that the headless body belonged to a female that bell had called over and when she made the decision that she was going to run away and fake her death she killed this woman but cut off her cut off her head because she didn't want people to identify it as obviously not being that of her own so that be, be, you know that starts off a folks a folks tale and that is that so that you know that bell is still alive today so point is that he ends up dying no one ever really knows if bell's body is really her body they she just disappears and point is that also in 1931 there's a woman named esther carson who is arrested for poisoning this man named austin lindstorm for money and point is she has a picture of bell gunness in her possession and it is speculated that she is bell gunness however in closing she dies before she is convicted and no one ever knows if esther and bell are the exact same person they did um pull out the headless body to examine it but they weren't able to get good dna off the body so that is that so bell gunness might have lived and gotten away with murder or maybe she didn't because she then got arrested as esther so definitely a crazy story guys um this is definitely a crazy story you should look it up read more into it and that is all i have for you i hope you enjoy like i say say no to murderers yes to murder stories and i will definitely catch you guys on the next one you wouldn't believe i recorded this like 30 times it is crazy i i can't believe everything that i've had to go through to get this video going but like i said i hope you enjoy and i will catch you guys next sunday's my love and i hope you love this polish <laughs> bye